Today, I'd like to talk to you about the PMBOK 6th edition. If you recall, four years ago, I did something very, very similar to that for the PMBOK 5th edition. So what I will do today, it's I will start from the first process that you should do in your project up to the end. And why I'm doing this? One of the key reasons I'm doing this, it's because if you look at the PMBOK guide, very thick, six, seven hundred pages, uh, the first reaction is, well, it's, it's a lot to learn, it's, it's a very strong uh, body inside and it's, it's not very easy to understand. The PMBOK guide, it's mostly a reference guide. So what I would do here, it's to read the PMBOK guide, but in a different way. And this is basically on part two of the guide, because on the sixth edition of PMBOK, we have 13 chapters on the first part. The three first chapters are the general concepts. What is a project? What's project management? The second chapter is more about organizational structure, how the structures change depending on, on how much leverage do you give to the projects. The third chapter, it's a new one, talks about the project manager and mostly on the PMI talent triangle and discuss more about the competences of the project manager. Between chapter four up to chapter 13, we're talking about the 10 knowledge areas. And then on part two is the standard, the ANSI standard of project management. And this used to be chapter three on the previous version. And this is the core, the second part of what I'm talking now. Because most of the time when you read, for example, scope, you read all process of scope. But it's not the way you do projects, because you do projects in a different way. You do in a much more interconnected way. And this is what I want you to teach you today how to do that. The first thing you need to have is this piece of paper. So this you can download on the link below. So you can download this and you can download the processes. Then you put some glue or a tape here to use it as a reference. So I will do this today to show you how a project is built. So look, here we have in a light gray, just to help me to show you and also to guide you through the process. So the first thing we need to understand that it's every single project start on what we call initiating process. So initiating process Basically, when you start a project, it doesn't matter which kind of project you're talking, you start by developing the project charter. Project charter, the best way to explain to you is birth certificate. Why I'm saying this? Because it's, it's something that recognizes that a project exists. So here, you give a name, a name, a project manager, some basic conditions, it's a one or two page document just to underline what is the intention and why this project exists. In parallel to that, you do a stakeholder process that is to identify stakeholders. So let me explain this. What is a stakeholder? A stakeholder is any person or entity that has any kind of interest in your project. Maybe positive, maybe negative. So a supplier, a client, another area in your organizations, they are all stakeholders. And look, one important point. If you see here 4.1 means we are talking about the chapter four of PMBOK, first process. Chapter four is integration. Okay, and this is 13.1. 13 is stakeholder management. So we do this almost together. One very important point is that a lot of people do not understand this arrow that goes both ways. 
Why this? Because you don't do this first and then you do this. You do this almost together. And this arrow allows you to go back because when you identify some stakeholder, maybe you need to revisit your project charter and vice versa. So to do that, it's what you built the initiation. And one very important point, if you read the PMBOK from page one to the, to the end, you read four, and then you read five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, and then you read 13. So I'm telling you, read 4.1, then go to 13.1 and take a look because this is how things happen in reality. So when you have the initiation, you have your project charter, this very light, slim document that just address what your project will do. And then a list of who are my stakeholders. This is what is the initiation of a project. After initiation, the initiation, we need to do the planning. And this is exactly to try to understand how we are planning to do our project. So we will basically understand pieces, pieces that we need to have in place to make sure that this idea here will satisfy the interest of the stakeholders and will deliver what you want. Remember, we, are, we do not live and create projects to respect the flow. The flow must reflect the reality of the work we do. And basically, to do that, we started here by integration. What do we need to do here? We need to start the planning by integration. And the integration is the second process of integration that is called develop the project management plan. So let me explain to you integration. Integration only exists to be the glue that connects the other nine areas. That's it. Integration exists to avoid that. Scope overrule risk. Risk overrule cost. So the integration is to make sure that everything is balanced, producing the benefit of the project and the results you want here. So to develop the project plan, then you need to do a lot of things and work in different areas. The first one that you need to start working is the area of scope. And you need to plan how you will manage the scope of your project. Look, you will see many times here, plan scope management, plan schedule management. And every time you see the word plan and management, we are talking about the rule of the game. So what is plan scope management? You need to define here, how do you plan to manage the scope of your project? Let's suppose that someone wants to add work to your project. Will you accept it? Not accept it? It must be approved. What is the level of approval? So this is the rule. I love to use an analogy. Imagine a football game, a soccer game. You have some rules. For example, there are 11 players. The goal is only when the ball cross the line fully. So you have some rules. Why? Because you cannot define the rules when you are executing the project. Right? You need to agree on the rules. And these are the rules. And this may be a set of bullets, maybe a small document, or maybe something that your project office will create. But it's something that delineates the rules of how you plan to manage scope. And then the second thing you need to do is to collect the requirements. So now I need to understand what is the work I need to do. And then I need to collect the requirements. First, what is a requirement? Requirements are things that I need to do to deliver what I want. For example, the requirements can be functional requirements. For example, um, I want an, um, for example, an electric door in my car. This is a functional requirement. What is a technical requirement? It's what is the size and the characteristics of this engine 
to support that door opening automatically. And then you have the scope and the requirements of activities. Buy the, the engine, install the engine, test the engine. So this is where you collect. And most of the time you collect these requirements by talking to some of the stakeholders and trying to understand how you will build the way between where you are and where you want to be. After collecting these requirements, you must shape the scope of your project. Basically, you need to combine these requirements, functional, technical, and activities and, and, and parts of the work, and you define the scope. Basically, you produce one, one document. I, I, I don't like the word document because it, it seems like bureaucracy, but you produce something that reflects the scope of your project, and we call this scope statement. So the scope statement will define, okay, how do you want to approach your project? And after that, you will create the work breakdown structure or WBS. Remember, the WBS is that it looks like an org chart where you split your project and you break your project into smaller, much more manageable pieces of work. I love this and I think that the WBS is the tool to manage the scope. So these four processes are things you need to do to deliver your work. And this will be a piece of your project plan. After you know what you want to do, you need to understand how much time do you plan. Then you do a plan schedule management, and this you will work on the schedule. Remember, why I spend some time explaining the scope? Because here is absolutely the same of plan scope management, but here I'm concerned about schedule. For example, what I will do if some tasks become late? How I'm planning to calculate durations? Will I do analogy? Which kind of tool I'm planning to use? How how precise do I need to be when I set uh, an activity duration? So these are basically the rules of the game when the game is talking about schedule. And one point that you may notice for those who are from coming from the PMBOK 5th edition, it usually to be called time and now it's called schedule because we are talking about the time and how the times flow in your project. After that, you will define the activities. Very, very important here. Here you create a WBS. Here you are defining activities you need to accomplish to deliver that work package on your WBS. So let me give you an example. WBS package, door, tasks, cut the door, frame the door, put the lock. So these are the activities that will deliver that scope. And why activities are here? Because the activities are the root of you create your sequence and the duration. So you need to have this capillarity. You need to understand which kind of activities to then understand, okay, how much time? And what do I need to do first? And look one thing. Are you looking that I'm making a lot of arrows? Why I'm spending my time doing this, all these sets of arrows? It's because I want to make clear and that the biggest is mistake. And even when people talk and use the concept of waterfall, you know, when you use the waterfall, when the water goes down, the water does not come back. So this technically cannot be seen as waterfall because I'm talking that we go back all the time to revisit because maybe you are putting a duration here and you see, oh God, I forgot another activity and then you need to come back. And most of the time you may come back here. And this is a fluid process. It's a fluid, it's not rigid. If it's rigid, it's wrong. 
pay attention on that. If it's rigid, it's wrong. So this is just a mental model to help you to understand how you should move. And after doing all of this, what you will do, you will develop your schedule. And many people ask me, okay, what is a schedule? Is it a Gantt chart? Is it a network uh, diagram? Uh, yes, yes, and much more. Schedule is any kind of display of how your project will be placed over time. The most common, of course, because of the tools are the Gantt chart, the network uh, diagram, but you need to develop your schedule. So the schedule here will give you an idea of how much time do you need to perform everything to perform and to deliver this scope. So this is the second group. Did you see that I'm bringing this, I'm bringing this again to the project plan. After that, scope schedule. I have the cost side because now I have the activities, I know the scope, now I can start thinking about the cost of my project. And the first thing I do, and I will repeat this many times, I need to plan the cost management. Did you see how things start to repeat? Plan cost, plan schedule, and plan scope. So here, rules of the scope. Here, rules of the schedule. Here, rules of the cost. For example, who has the approval to spend money? If I'm over, uh, 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 for example, the cost of one, one material or one resource is over budget, who has the autonomy to approve that? What do I do? So these are the rules of the game when the game is talking about cost. Then after that, I will estimate costs. If I know the activities and I have a clear idea of my scope, I can estimate cost. And then after estimating cost, knowing that I have my schedule, I can do what? I can develop my budget. I can understand my S-curve. I can understand how do I plan to spend the money. And these three tasks are part of the planning process related to scope. After that, I need to plan the quality management again one more time, remember? When the word plan and management comes together, we only change here what? The knowledge area. So what do I want here? You may answer with me. I want here to know which are the quality standards I need to comply with the project. What is quality for me? On this context, what do I expect to be delivered in terms of quality? And this will also be together with my project plan. After that, I need to start, remember, look, eight, seven, six, these are the chapters. So it's very common for those who are not used to the PMBOK, it's very common that we say, oh, chapter six. When we say chapter six, we are talking about schedule. So this is why we start with four, and why not with three or two or one? Because chapter one, two, and three, they are definitions, and this is why we start with number four. So now I need to introduce to you to a new knowledge area, but an old new knowledge area. It used to be called human resources, but now it's just resources. Why? Because now I am incorporating on this area materials, equipment, and human resources. So now this knowledge area is called resource. And the first one is plan resource management. So every single one, it's plan management. Rules of the game of how do I plan to manage my resources in a very simple way. So how do I plan to recruit? Am I able to recruit people or do I need to use internal resources? Am I able to buy things or do I need to use the procurement area? So these are all here. These are the rules. Remember, most of the time, if you have 
any area that supports your project, like a project management office or a PMO. Most of this is already done. You have some rules, some policies in place that regulate what you can do as a project management and what you can't. After that, you need to estimate activity resources. Oops, let's understand this. Let's understand this because here we have something new. In the past, activity resource or estimate resource used to be on the time. Now, with this new resource area, it was moved to resource. But I want you to pay attention on this. This item 9.2, okay, and this item 6.4, 6 they are brothers. They are twins better. They, were, they, they cannot live without the other. Why? Because I need to, do, to know which resource I have to estimate how much time I will take. Let me give you a very super simple example. Let's take this wall and let's take, uh, I say, oh, one worker can build this wall in 10 days. It's reasonable to say that two workers can build in five days. So this is exactly what I'm talking here, because most of the tasks, most, I'm not saying all, are effort driven. When I say effort driven, I'm saying if you add more resources, you reduce the time up to a certain level. So this is why it used to be together. Now it's in two different areas. Does it mean that you will need to do it separately? No, never. Think about that. So these two processes are the process related to resources. Remember one thing. Costs are intimately linked to resources and time. So did you see that how things work together? So if you were reading the PM book, you should try to follow something like that. You should not read 9.3. After 9.2, I suggest you to read 10.1. And why 10.1? Because this is what you should do in the planning phase. Then you do communications management. Look, as I said here, rules of scope, schedule, cost, quality, resource. Here is communication. Here it's just a slight different. This plan communication management one of the key things here is you will build your communication plan. So basically you know what do you want to communicate? Who do you want to communicate to? What, uh, where do you want to communicate? When do you want to communicate? How much uh, it will cost this communication? How do you want to communicate? So this basic information. So if you have a meeting, if you are planning an exception meeting, if you have, for example, meetings only if something goes wrong uh, outside the boundaries. So you can put this here because this will regulate your communication. So it's a very, very important. I will talk about this a little bit later when, when I'm talking about stakeholders here. So after doing that, then it comes to another very big knowledge area, almost as big as, as scope and schedule, is risk management. Why? Because risk is an intrinsic part of your project. So the first thing you need to do is to plan how you want to approach risk management. And, and let me explain here, basically, the answer you want to give here. The only answer that is super relevant is what is your tolerance? Why? Let's suppose I invite you to do a bank jump. Maybe for me, it's extremely risky. Maybe for you, it's not. So tolerance, it's exactly what defines what is risk for your group and your organization and what is not risk for your group and your organization. Because if you don't know what is your tolerance, maybe everything can be a risk or nothing can be a risk. After knowing that you, uh, your risk tolerance, then you come here and you start to identify your risks. 
So together with your stakeholders, your group, you start to identify, okay, which kind of risk do I have in this project? Which kind of threats and opportunities do I need to manage? After, let's suppose you identify here, let me guess, 300 things that may happen in your project, positive and negative. What do you need to do after that? You, you cannot say, oh, I will answer to everything. It, most of the time, it's just impossible. So what do you do? You do two things. You do a qualitative risk analysis and a quantitative risk analysis. So you do both. What is the difference between these two items? Qualitative, I use a scale. Low, medium, high. Green color, yellow color, red color. So I use some kind of standard, some kind of scale. And what is a quantitative risk analysis? Is when I use math to calculate probability and impact. For example, let's suppose I have a dice of six faces and I want to know what is the chance to get one in the dice. It's one divided by six. So this is calculated, this is quantitative. Many times quantitative is great, but many times quantitative is much harder to get. So this is exactly to understand each of the risks identified, are they big, are they very big risks or, or irrelevant risks? And this will help me to do what? This will help me to plan potential responses to that risks. So what I need to do here, I need to plan, I need to identify, okay, what can I do to protect my project from that risk? then maybe I will say I'll buy an insurance or maybe I will say I will change some parts of my scope. Maybe I will put more financial reserves. So it depends. So then you plan this and these five processes, they work together. Again, look the arrows. They go forward and backward. Why? Because maybe you are doing a quantitative analysis and suddenly you identify another risk. And you cannot say, oh, the risk is done. I cannot go back. This is not good. If you do that, you will be wrong, completely wrong. Then you go back here. Maybe you don't go only back here. You look, go to the plan to understand the integrated impact of your response. To understand, okay, do I need to put more money? So remember, this is all fluid. This, look, all the process only exists to support you to understand what you need to do. That's it. So now, on the procurement plan, so you need to understand basically what you need to do. And what you need to do in terms of what? What do I need to buy? What do I need to make? So the make or buy decision is doing here. So what I would do with, with my procurement? Will I do everything internally or not? And last but definitely not least is the plan the stakeholder engagement. And what is this? Remember, identify the stakeholders here. So now I need to understand, I need to map my stakeholders. For example, influence and power. And I need to group them and understand what I will do here. And now I want to give you another advice. Remember the twins I said here, between duration and resources? I want to introduce you to another set of twins. Plan communication, remember I introduced, and plan stakeholder engagement. Why I'm telling these two are also twins? Because most of the communication will be exactly to reinforce stakeholder engagement. So I need to do this together. For example, let's suppose that you have a stakeholder here, that you need some kind of special communication. Then you come here and you create this communication. So this is why they are twins and they work together. So this was the planning process. And at the end, everything 
it's consolidated in this project management plan. Okay, so this will give you an idea on how do you plan to do this project. This, I'm working about what, what, and here, how. So this is my approach to this project. And then later, we'll talk about how do we execute and monitor and control our project. After having our plan ready, we will start the execution and the monitoring and controlling process. So I want now, of course, I will explain first the execution, but I want now to highlight both execution and monitoring and control. Why I wanted to highlight these two process at the same time? Because they work together. You don't execute everything to check if everything is fine. So it's a process that is a very fluid process here. So you execute and you check, everything is fine, then, then you may replan, look this arrow, you may re-execute, so it's a very, very fluid process. And of course, the center of the planning was integration. The center of the initiation was integration. The center of the execution is exactly, one more time, integration. So the third integration process. The second was the plan. The third, direct and managed project work. What is important here? It's not saying executing the project. Why? Because all this flow is how you will manage the project. And now you, you as a project manager or a team member, you usually are not the, the resource executing the work most of the time. So what do you need to do? You direct and you manage the work that is being done by what? By the resources you are defining for the activities. So this is exactly the idea. And now there is one new thing on the PMBOK 6th edition. It's a new integration process called Manage Project Knowledge. In a very, very simple way. You can understand this as lessons learned. So what do you do? You need to register what you're learning from the project work. What is working, what is not working, what is doing well, not well, and you register this because this knowledge is very, it's, it's very valuable. So you need to have these lessons learned. So these two processes are the two central processes of the execution. But these two processes are supported by all this other process. Let's see them. The first one is manage quality. Remember one thing, here, plan quality. Here you are setting how your quality will be. Here you are managing. The results that I'm getting from here are reasonable in terms of quality. Now related to resources you will acquire the resources. Here is where you will hire new team members, buy materials, buy things. And this process is a central process here in the execution together with this, because the work will be done by these resources. And it's very important. Why we do it here and not here on, on, the, on the planning? because I always try to do this as late as possible because this is money. So resources, I always wait until the last minute. Of course, look, this is not mathematics. This is project management. So maybe sometimes there is a delay between the time that you acquire the resources and the time they are available for you. So many times you need to anticipate and starting some procurement process and some acquisition process here, of course, for obvious reasons. Then 
of course, for the human resources you acquired, you will develop a team. And at the same time, manage this team. Another question you may ask me, what's the difference between develop and manage? Develop the team is to make the res human resources you brought to the project work together as a team where one plus one is more than two. Manage a team, it's more towards the operational aspects. What is operational aspects? Oh, someone needs to take leave. Someone uh, is sick and cannot come. So you manage the daily work of your team. So it's a very, very important process. And this process will happen during all the execution. And they will be a supporting pillar to the two central pro processes. Then after that, what I need to do? I need to manage my communications. This is the execution of your plan. So remember, you build a plan, base it on the stakeholders you want to engage. Here is the time of you making the meetings. So when you say, where is the, the status report meeting? It's here, exactly here in the managing communications that will support your execution. Then after that, you need to implement risk responses. Wow, this is new too. This is new because here I'm planning the risk responses. Here I'm implementing. Let's suppose here I plan to buy an insurance. Here I buy the insurance. I'm planning to change something in the scope. Here is where I change things. So this is the actions related to the plans. And one thing, together with the project knowledge, let me put a mark here. These are two new processes for the PMBOK Guide 6th edition. After that, I will conduct procurement. Buy things. Remember, here you made a decision of make and buy. If it's buy, you need to come here and buy it. So you conduct all the procurement processes. Base it on what? Base it exactly on how you plan your procurement. One important thing I said about the twins here, remember? Between activity durations and resources. Twins here between stakeholder management and communication plan. Now I have the third set of twins. Conduct procurement and acquire resources. Why? Because most of the time, the way you acquire resources will require a procurement process. So these are presented in two separate ways. But in reality, they are all the same thing. Because you need to buy a material, then you need to conduct a procurement to buy that material. So these are two processes that are very well connected. Last but not least here in the execution, you manage the stakeholder engagement. So let's understand that. Identify my stakeholders here. I plan, I understood their power, their influence, their interests. And then I created a communication plan to manage my communication with them. Here, I'm managing. Is my process to engage these stakeholders working? Or do I need to change? Let's suppose that I have a group that is very resistant to my project. Is, is my approach working with them or not? Or should I change? Should I change my approach? Maybe I'm sending, okay, write, written reports. Maybe I should call. I don't know. So, but here you need to see what is happening with the stakeholder engagement. Is it something changing here? For example, someone is gaining power, losing interest. So you manage your stakeholders here. These are the execution process. And then we move to the monitoring and controlling process that will work together with the execution. On the monitoring and controlling, I am doing things in parallel. Here, I'm doing the work. Here, I'm making sure that the work I'm doing here is okay. Remember, I started with integration, integration, and integration. What I will start here? 
integration. And what do I do? I will monitor and control the work. So here I'm managing and directing. I'm assigning tasks, running with the resources towards the results. Here I'm saying, is it everything okay? Is the time I was planning here on the, on the schedule, is it working or not? Second, I need to perform the integrated control change. This is a really, 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 really important process. And why this process is so important? Because your project will face changes. A hundred percent sure of that. There is no way that what you estimated here will happen perfectly because the world has so many variabilities that it's just impossible. So what do you need? You need to manage these changes. You need to understand. And the second word that is extremely important here is this. Integrated. Integrated means I'm not only working scope, time, cost, quality. I'm working on everything. And if there is a change, how I can make this change in a way that it will be great for the project. Not great for scope, for example, but great for the project as a whole. And then what I need to do, I need to do a series of work. The first work I need to do is basically, basically I need to validate the scope and then control the scope. So I need to validate and control. What's the difference here? It's just a check. I check the scope that's here defined in the scope statement was delivered. And if something is different, I need to control the scope. Remember, all these words starting with control are subsets with this integrated. So here I'm concerned about changes in the scope of the project. For example, I was building a house and when I see I'm not building a house anymore, I'm building a restaurant. Whoops, what's going on here? The second, it's of course and obvious. Let me just link here, make this group here on the scope and attach this to the integration. Then the second one is control schedule. Is it something going wrong? Am I becoming late? Is there any issue on time? Remember, here I have a schedule, but maybe things are not perfect. So here I control. Remember, here the focus is on time. Here, scope, control scope, control schedule. And this will be added to this integrated uh, change control. Then I need to control costs. So look, look, did you see, did you see one thing? That there is a lot of repetition in different areas. So when you read, you need to understand, because if you understood one, you understood all, because they are just different topics. So here, let's suppose, let, let's give an example. Let's suppose that you estimated cost, look, 7.2. Base it on a resource. Then you did on 12.2 a procurement process to hire the, or to buy this resource. And then the resource was much more expensive than what you expected. Then you start running over budget. Then you need to control this cost. So this is exactly how things work here. It's a, it's a very, very fluid process. Then you need to control quality. All tasks related to changes in quality will be here. Most of the total quality management tasks, they are here. Most of the statistical process are here. So you need to control the quality, right? Because when you are managing the quality here, they are different from what you expect on your quality management plan. So look, it, it's a very, very fluid. Then you need to control resource. Oops, for those with the PMBOK 5th edition, this is a new process. Okay, new process together 
with implement risk response and manage project knowledge. So the control resource, what do I mean by that? Do I need to add more resources? Do I need to reduce? Are the resources performing in the level that I want? After that, I need to monitor communications. Remember, let's go to the communication, understand the communication process. Look here, I have a plan, 10.1. That is based on a certain stakeholder engagement, 13.2. Then, during the process, I manage, I issue the reports, the meetings, whatever, the phone calls, and then I manage this stakeholder. But maybe I need to change. Then I monitor, because this, I may update my plan. Or maybe I will update the way I manage. So it's exactly what I'm looking here. Then, in, in parallel, this all happens at the same time in a very fluid way. I monitor risks. Why? Because some risks that I thought, oh, they are low. For example, here, I did a qualitative risk analysis on 11.3, say it's low, but something happens and the, the risks became very, very high. Let me give you a very quick example. Let's suppose that I'm importing some products and let's suppose that these products will be arriving close to the end of the year. And let's suppose that the customs of my country decide to say, I will close my operations between 15th of December and 15th of January. This will increase dramatically your probability of having the product late. So you need to monitor because the risks, they change everything. Look, look on TV, what happens. Every day on TV, things change when we are talking about monitoring risks. Then after that, we need to control my procurement. What is this? This is where I make payments, I receive goods, I receive service. So all the process that it's based on the procurements I did on the execution. So these are working together. And of course, very close to monitor communications, very close to monitor communications, item 10.3, I need to monitor stakeholder engagement. Why? because stakeholders may change. So I'm managing and changing. And look, this again, these two process, they are happening almost at the same time in a very, very integrated way. Remember, here I maybe come back. So one thing that I'm super concerned when I'm teaching this is that people think and think wrongly that this is, you know, written on stone, that when you do this, you never come back. Look, one more time, this is wrong. And this is why I'm telling you, despite of, of several comments, this is very agile too. This is absolute, it's so agile that PMI on the PMBOK released the agile practice together with this to show how agile components can be used here, can be used here. But of course, if you think that you write a, a requirement and then it's over, or that this is just put in on paper, that, then you are in trouble. But understand one thing, these are very fluid and they do not need to be very large formal, but it's more a mental process. For example, I'm just talking to you and presenting this, and this seems to me extremely logical. So I initiate, I plan, I execute and monitor, and then I go to the closing process. So after doing this, so let's suppose that my project is over. I deliver, so the, the stakeholder, the client, receive the product. So now what I need to do, I need to go to the closing process. And the closing process, process is based on one integration process that is close project or phase. Why project or phase? Because I can use this for the project or for just one piece of the product. I can do this for every single piece, like a rolling wave. And here, I will include 
all the work I need to do. I need to celebrate, I need to hand out the documents and this. What is very, very important here is that in the past it used to have another process here called closing procurement. And this process disappeared and was incorporated here. So the closing is just this closed project of phase to simplify and to unify that here you are closing basically everything. So if you see the old 47 processes, 47 boxes, became now 49. Why 49? 47 plus the three new ones, 50, minus this one, 49. So this is the full set of the PMBOK guide. Now, what I want to suggest to you, so how you can learn this in a very simple and direct way. I want to invite you, please go to my website, download this, the link is below. Download this, download these pieces, okay? They are in Portuguese and English. Put the tape in the back and just play and have fun. Try to do it alone, try to understand. And with the PMBOK guide in your hands, you can say, Plan procurement management, I'm not sure about what is that. You can go and read a little bit more. You will understand the logic and everything that I showed to you today. It's logic, it's nimble, and it's agile. It's agile. Unfortunately, a lot of people misunderstand this and they spend all the time just producing this. It's, it's like an ideology. Forget that. What is relevant is you delivering your project. I use hundreds of aspects of Agile and hundreds of aspects of this. It depends on which kind of project I'm doing, how I'm doing the project. Sometimes I do all the projects, sometimes I do less, but this is a guideline. It's exactly you start, you plan, you execute and control, and you close in a very simple way. But you don't need to say, oh, I'm not following the PMBOK guide because I'm not doing item 9.4. Don't do that. Don't waste your time thinking about that. Remember, the framework exists to support your project and not your life exists to support the framework. Think about that, have fun, test this, and then you can read and understand the PMBOK and all this process flow in a very, very easy way. One last thing, remember the, the arrow that goes both sides. This is exactly why I don't want you to consider this waterfall because the water that falls does not come back. Here, what I'm telling to you and ANSI is telling to you and PMBOK is that everything can come back. And most of the time, everything comes back to be fixed because the, the perfect conditions do not exist in your project. Think about that, practice, and good luck.